Pokemon Sun and Moon recently came out again, though this time as a finished product, though I might be getting ahead of myself by saying that. Back when the original Sun and Moon came out, they did pique my interest quite a bit. But the more time I spent with my copy of Moon, the more I found myself quickly feeling fatigued. That's not to say that I found Sun and Moon to be bad games, but it did get me thinking. Is this just me? Am I getting too tired of the series? Or is there perhaps a bigger problem here? So let's take a look back at a 2015 interview with Shigeki Morimoto, the director of Heart Gold and Soul Silver, that has really stuck with me since. He said the following in Iwata asks, As I mentioned earlier, we've been greedy in the amount of gameplay elements we squeezed in here. There's so much included that I even had colleagues saying to me, are you sure you should be going this far with a remake? In that sense, it's not simply a remake. I think it's more than that. For that reason, I would like to see these games enjoyed by as large a number of people as possible. To me, this exemplifies the mindset Game Freak used to have when designing a new Pokemon game. They poured everything they had into making the best experience they could, not just the best profit margin. I think this thought process really peaked around Generation 5. The amount of content was staggering. The region of Unova was filled with hidden secrets and extra content around every corner, many of which you had to wait until the post-game to even be allowed to discover. And instead of Generation 5 just treating you to an enhanced version of the original games, this time they gave you a flat-out sequel. The team implemented tons of features for this one, ranging from just being fun like the Pokemon World Tournament or useful like Join Avenue. And especially during the first Black and White, they really managed to capture, in my opinion, the feeling of the original games. By creating a region that felt distinct from anything we've ever seen before, this feeling only being enhanced by them relying entirely on the use of new Pokemon during the main campaign. That campaign, which ended up possibly being the best in the series, presenting interesting characters and concepts that shook up the formula. Before parallel universes took precedent over narrative and lore, that actually mattered. Then X and Y happened, and it did none of those things. Gone was the distinct design of the region, here in Kalos, one second you're in a scorching desert, then you take five steps and you're in a frozen tundra. After all, we have to fit 457 Pokemon into one region, for some reason. And I hope you like Generation 1, because while Gen 5 tried recreating some of the first game's magic by presenting you with a completely fresh experience full of Pokemon and lands you've never seen, however, that ended up being too subtle and doesn't sell. So instead, you get Kano starters handed to you at the beginning of the the game, two new Charizards, and Pikachu saying its own name just like it did back in the anime, guys. Remember that? Sadly, this was only the start of it, and besides Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, pretty much every new release had to spend excessive amounts of time reminding you that there was a point where you actually cared about this franchise, through a variety of sick references to the point where you even get a shiny Professor Oak in Sun and Moon. One of the main selling points of X and Y was that we were finally getting the 3D mainline Pokemon game most of us wanted since we were kids, but along with new graphics, came another issue that has been persisting throughout every single Pokemon game since, the performance issues. Now, I don't know the technical specifics, I won't lie to you, but when I see something like Smash Brothers running at 60 FPS with 4 players and all items on, I'm a bit skeptical of the claim that having two relatively static models on screen can't run at a constant frame rate. Maybe if this was just an issue with X and Y, it'd be plausible to say that they didn't fully optimize the engine yet, and to be fair, since X and Y, it has improved a bit. But we're 4 games in now and I still can't get a constant frame rate even on my new 3DS, and that's just insulting. As I said, this issue with many others persisted forward into the series, as well as bringing new ones. The next game in the series, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, was highly anticipated by fans. For years prior, you couldn't be anywhere near the Pokemon fandom without seeing jokes or memes of Hoenn being confirmed. This was largely in part not only due to nostalgia, but every remake that came prior was packed full of new content, improvements, and just overall a better experience. It allowed you to feel excited playing the game you loved again with a whole bunch of enhancements and new surprises. Like I quoted earlier, they were greedy with how much they wanted to give fans, but what we got this time is something nowhere near the quality of other remakes. A recurring issue I have with this series, even the best games in it, is they tend to drop well-received features, many interviews stating that they do this just to make regions feel unique. The Gen 3 remakes being an especially annoying example, as it took out one of the best additions to the series, which is character customization. You could try to argue it was to keep the original designs, but that loses all weight when you consider both of the main characters got redesigns for this entry anyway. Though that isn't even close to the most offensive case of missing content in this game. 
As I said in the past, remakes like Heart Gold and Soul Silver managed to pack their cartridge full of content, improving and adding on much of what the original games offered. But while Mega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire might not be a bad game on its own, as a remake, it again doesn't come close to what we've had in the past. The content from the third version of Generation 3, Pokemon Emerald, was left out in its entirety and in some ways, it almost feels like the game mocks the player by mentioning the missing Battle Frontier on multiple occasions, and in its place you get the Battle Maison from X and Y, lazily copy-pasted into the game. Now you might make the argument that maybe they ran out of time, or the budget was too small to include a remastered Battle Frontier and other features, but as it turns out, this was a deliberate choice by the developer's own admission. In fact, in an interview with Junichi Masuda, he said this, Using smartphones and other devices, they can access a great number of games, so the time they dedicate to a single game is less than in the past. We didn't put the Battle Frontier in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire for this very reason. The interviewer then goes on to summarize, in short, he means that they didn't include the Battle Frontier because only a very small part of the players would have fully appreciated and made use of this feature. Nowadays, players get bored and frustrated more easily, and they aren't interested in things that are demanding or challenging. As you can see, this is a sharp contrast to what the team said years ago. They used to focus on pleasing all types of fans with a variety of content, but now they're more than happy just to appeal to the lowest common denominator. That's not to say that Pokemon games haven't always been maximizing profits, but it was clear that in the past they cared more about creating a product they could be proud of, way more than they do now. As I said, with the original Sun and Moon, they managed to pique my interest. This was largely due to one of my biggest gripes with X and Y being seemingly solved, and I can say it indeed was. There is a distinct theme that's represented in nearly all Pokemon locations and characters you encounter on your journey. It also brought back trainer customization, which was a worry after Mega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire lacked the feature, and they also did improve on the performance issues. However, in many other ways, Sun and Moon feels like a culmination of the problems of the past, while adding some more of its own. Something you've no doubt heard people complaining about is the extensive tutorials within these games. In the past, these tutorials were rather short, and after setting you up for the adventure, you were free to go and do your own thing. But in Sun and Moon's case, the tutorial is filled with an endless array of cutscenes, stretching this time that used to be only a few minutes to around an hour. Then when you're finally finished that slog, you are once again endlessly interrupted with cutscenes, constantly breaking the pace of the journey, making you feel like that tutorial never ended. A reason for those overuse of cinematics very well might come from an interview with the developers of the game on storytelling ま、例えばサンムーンですと結構ストーリー性みたいなものをその今までのシリーズと比べるとえっと入れてきたかなと思ってます。これはどっちかというとそのハードがやっぱり進化するにつれて表現力が上がってきているっていうこともあるので、や
Black and White 2 already had a bit of an issue with having too many legendaries in them, but at least they were located in actual places in Unova. Ever since Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, they just throw every legendary ever at you through generic dimensional portals, something which sadly repeats itself in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Lastly, what really cemented the creation of this video and what leads back to everything I've been talking about is what a step backwards Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon is to me. With the third version of Pokemon games, you can argue that it truly feels like a completed product, while the others were almost a beta of sorts. For me though, I always felt as though the previous version still felt like a whole experience, and the third was an enhanced port. When I went through Sun and Moon, however, there were often areas that felt unfinished and barren. This was a big factor in making me feel as if the original releases were just betas when they announced they were going back to the old formula. I thought this was a problem that was already fixed and improved upon in Generation 5, where we were given an actual sequel, but now instead we're given a product that could be argued as even less than those old third versions that came before it. So in the end, yes, I think there's a plethora of bigger issues here, because I still like this series at its core. I'm not tired of the series, I'm just tired of the way it's being handled. I can only wish that one day that old design philosophy returns to the series. And there is hope, there are currently rumors going around that Game Freak is looking to disrupt the formula of the series, much like how Breath of the Wild did with Zelda. So it does seem I might not be the only one, seeing that the series needs changes. My only other wish is that if this game does come to be, they don't spoil everything worth caring about in the trailer again.